Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce jo Dr. Janine Clayton, who will deliver our welcoming remarks. Dr. Clayton. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Janine Clayton, the Associate Director for Research on Women's Health here at NIH and the Director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. This year, ORWH is celebrating our 30th anniversary. It was in 1990 that Congress, in response to concerns raised by the scientific community, by women and advocacy groups about gaps in women's health research, established ORWH to be the focal point at NIH on women's health research. A key part of our statutory mission is ensuring that research conducted and supported by NIH adequately addresses issues regarding the health of women. More recently, Strategic Goal 4 of the trans NIH Strategic Plan for Women's Health Research reaffirmed our commitment to training and particularly enhancing the knowledge of sex and gender influences on health and disease among all scientists, clinicians, and other health professionals to accelerate the translation of that knowledge into practice. In fulfillment of these mandates, ORWH recently expanded our interprofessional health education efforts to include an updated online course on sex and gender influences on health and disease, bench to bedside, integrating sex and gender to improve human health. Bench to Bedside addresses an unmet need in medical curricula to specifically address sex and gender specific health impacts. A 2019 audit of a set of nationally representative medical curricula revealed that less than one quarter of all sessions provided raised the topic of sex and gender influences on physiology or pathophysiology or the experience of the patient in the healthcare environment. In a 2016 survey, fewer than 35% of US-based medical students reported that they would feel prepared to manage sex and gender differences in healthcare. Our hope is that this course, as part of our larger interprofessional health education programming, will prepare clinicians and researchers to confidently consider sex and gender in their work. In this way, Bench to Bedside can play an important role in improving women's health. We're very excited about the course's potential, especially because online learning has proved effective in educating both researchers and medical professionals about sex and gender-based health inequalities and inequities. As ORWH looks ahead, we are optimistic that efforts like our interprofessional education program will contribute to expanded knowledge of the mechanisms and extent of sex and gender influences on health. Such knowledge is essential to good science at all levels of biomedical research and in clinical practice where bench and bedside meet. Only when those effects are studied and understood can all of us receive the comprehensive care that we deserve. I'd now like to introduce again my ORWH colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Barr. Elizabeth? Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Clayton. As Dr. Clayton mentioned, Bench to Bedside explores sex and gender influences on health. Sex is a biological classification. It is determined based on an individual's chromosomes, gonads, sex hormones, external reproductive organs, and internal genitalia. Gender is a social classification. Gender refers to socially enacted roles and behaviors which occur in a historical and cultural context and can vary across societies and over time both sex and gender influence health and disease. The Bench to Bedside course was developed in partnership with the Food and Drug Administration Office of Women's Health and a global team of non-federal subject matter experts. The course has six modules that explore sex and gender influences on health and disease. The primary objective of this self-paced online course is for learners to apply knowledge of sex and gender influences when conducting research or interpreting evidence for clinical practice. Each module incorporates examples from basic science, epidemiology, clinical trials, and translation into practice. The modules prepare participants to understand the importance of considering the influence of sex and gender throughout the research spectrum and beyond. Bench to Bedside focuses on key health conditions in which sex and gender have an impact. Modules on immunology, cardiovascular disease, and pulmonary disease launched earlier, late last year and earlier this year on the ORWH website 
the neurology module debuted last Thursday, August 27th, and the final two modules, endocrinology and mental health, will be released this fall. We are fortunate to be joined by one of the neurology module's authors today, Dr. Farida Sarabji, who is an expert in age and sex differences in neuroinflammatory diseases. I will now turn it over to Dr. Mia Whitaker, who will introduce Dr. Sarabji. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Mia Whitaker, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Farida Sarabji. Dr. Sarabji is the Regents Professor, Shelton Professor of Neuroscience and Interim Department Head of Neuroscience and Experimental Therapeutics at Texas A&M University College of Medicine. She obtained a joint doctoral degree in neurobiology and biopsychology from the University of Rochester, Rochester, New York, and completed her postdoctoral training at Columbia University, New York. She joined the faculty of Texas A&M College of, Mer of Medicine in 1998. Dr. Sarabji directs a federally funded research program that focuses on sex and age differences in stroke and Alzheimer's disease. She is a fellow of the American Heart Association Stroke Council and a member of the inaugural class of Texas A&M Presidential Impact Fellows. Dr. Sarabji is act actively involved in the training of graduate and medical students, and mentorship of junior faculty. She is the founder and director of the Women's Health in Neuroscience program at the Texas A&M College of Medicine, and a strong advocate for the inclusion of gender and sex differences in biomedical research. Again, we want to welcome Dr. Sarabji. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, can everybody see my screen? You're yes. great, Farida, good to go. Thank you. All right, so it is my pleasure to be talking about this particular subject, sex differences in brain disease. And the way I, the presentation is laid out is it's in three roughly equal parts. The first thing I'd like to do is stress the necessity for studying sex differences in biomedical research. Then I'd like to focus on sex differences in neurological diseases, especially stroke, Parkinson's, and epilepsy, which directly ties to the module that Dr. Barr just spoke about. And then finally, I'd like to talk about integrating sex differences in training efforts. I really can't see anybody or their chat, so all questions will, will be gathered and I'll be very happy to answer them later. So why should we care about sex differences in any disease? The most important reason is to ensure better health care for both men and women. To recognize especially that men and women may show different symptoms for the same disease and to recognize that the same drugs and therapies may not effectively work in both men and women. And these, both these points tie back to the first bullet, which is to ensure better health care for both sexes. The flip side of the coin is, what are the consequences of not paying attention to sex differences? The first of this is health disparities. We, we are very familiar with health disparities as they relate to many other uh, classifications, for example, ethnicity, income groups, etc. This is another aspect that will lead to health disparities if we don't pay sufficient attention to it. It's going to lead to poor health, health outcomes in one or the other sex, usually because of misdiagnoses or inadequate treatment. And what I'd like to do in the next few slides is give you an example of how not paying attention to both sexes can actually disadvantage one sex or the other. And I'm going to give you examples that uh, where both men or women will be disadvantaged. And we're going to start out with a little quiz. Um, there's really no good way for me to see all of your responses, so just make a record of them as we go along. And as I go through my talk, I will answer each of those. So the first is in the US, Women are most likely to die of what disease? Yay! Oh, perfect. 
Secondly, who is more likely to die from breast cancer, men or women? Women are more likely to develop osteoporosis, but are undertreated for this disease. True or false? And finally, pregnancy increases the risk for several diseases such as hypertension, stroke, type 2 diabetes, etc., but it decreases the symptoms of one major disease. Which one? As we go through this, hopefully you'll have the answers to these questions. My hope is that many of you already know the answers to these questions. So let's talk a little bit about the range of sex differences. They can be very obvious or they can be very subtle. So diseases that are unique to one sex, those would be the most obvious. Then there are diseases that occur more frequently in one sex as compared to the other. Diseases which present differently in one sex compared to the other. And diseases that are undertreated or under-recognized in one sex or the other. As you can see in all cases, it would lead to underdiagnosing, undertreating, and therefore resulting in health disparities among men and women. So let's look at a few examples of these. The first of these is diseases unique to one sex. So this would include cancer or infections of the reproductive system, uterine cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, pregnancy-related disorders, menopause-associated disorders. Now, these are unique to one sex because only one sex either has that particular organ or will undergo that particular biological process such as pregnancy. These are usually quite well understood and well studied. The ones where we need to focus most of our attention are really diseases that are undertreated or under-recognized in one sex or the other. And a very good example of this is cardiovascular disease. Women are less likely to get heart disease in, in their younger years, the 20 to 50 age range, but it was usually assumed that once they did exhibit heart disease, it would be very similar to men. Later studies showed that women were more likely to have a positive stress test with an angiogram that showed no blockages. That is, it didn't appear to be atherosclerosis. And subsequent work has shown that women may more likely have a type of heart disease that is linked to coronary microvascular dysfunction. In this case, I would say the advantage goes to males. Most large studies of the uh, pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease, as well as the clinical trials, have usually had many more men as compared to women. And this is one of the areas where inclusion of women has succeeded quite well. Another example of diseases that are undertreated or underrecognized in one sex or the other is breast cancer. Now, don't get me wrong. Male breast cancer is more rare as compared to women's breast cancer. 2,100 cases a year versus more than 226,000 cases in the case of women. However, if you look at the five-year survival rate for women overall, it is about 86.4%. And these overall survival rates are also more, more likely to advantage women, 60.4% as opposed to 45.8% for men. So in response to that question that I had there, men are likely to have greater mortality after breast cancer. They tend to be diagnosed with later stage cancers and when diagnosed, even with hormone receptor positive breast cancers, are less likely to be treated with hormone therapy, which is usually the, the first standard of care for, for hormone positive breast cancer. Here, the advantage is clearly women. In another example of undertreated or underrecognized diseases is osteoporosis. If I were to ask you to close your eyes and visualize a patient with osteoporosis, the likelihood is quite high that you are going to be visualizing a somewhat older, frail woman. Now, it is considered a disease of older women. However, the lifetime fracture risk for men 
over the age of 50. So now we're not counting fractures that occur as a result of sports activities, but age, it's about 30%. And 30 to 40% of all osteoporosis related fractures occur in men. So certainly it is not as disproportional as might have been imagined. Worse, men tend to have a higher mortality rate after sustaining a hip fracture as compared to women. 31% as compared to 17% in a very recent study. They also receive less biphosphonate prescriptions and this is important because th this treatment has been shown to actually reduce mortality after osteoporosis and hip fractures. A large number or a great amount of the reference data that is used for bone mineral density is actually based on women as a reference population as opposed to men, which may lead to underdiagnosis and may lead to undertreatment. So here it's advantage females. And I wanted to end with a slide that captures our current crisis. Diseases with greater fatality in one sex as com compared to the other. And this would be uh, an example of this would be COVID-19. I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Sabra Klein, for sending me the slide and the bullet points. The cases of COVID positivity depend on exposure, that is the behavior, the occupation, and even access to testing, as you might imagine. So there isn't a lot of difference in the number of cases between men and women. But what is consistently noted, and this is across the world, is that in terms of severity of the disease, as estimated by hospitalization, admission to the ICU, and death, is roughly twofold higher in, in men. Now, what you, will, what you will see throughout my, my presentation today is I'm going to lay out some of these sex differences for you, but this doesn't give me much of an opportunity to tell you why these sex differences occur. And, and while some of them might be due to differences in gonadal steroids, some of them might be due to genes or epigenetic factors associated with the sex chromosomes, this is an area of intense study for virtually all sex difference work that is uh, currently undertaken. I'm going to now pivot to sex differences in neurological diseases. As Dr. Barr mentioned, there is an e-learning module, uh, uh, several of them actually, and one of them has to do with neurological diseases. I'm going to focus very briefly on many of them, but the I encourage you to take a look at the module which goes into depth into a few of these neurological diseases and, and starts to address the issue about what we know in terms of their etiology, their pathophysiology, and uh, uh, the, the mechanisms underlying these sex differences. The most well known of sex differences is that of multiple sclerosis. The sex ratio or the difference in, in incidence of multiple sclerosis is usually heavily in, 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 uh, for women as compared to men, three is to one and uh, rising. It may be that, there, that a certain type of multiple sclerosis, this is an umbrella term for several disease processes, for example, the, the relapsing remitting kind occurs much more frequently in women. And unlike many of the other neurological diseases we'll be looking at in subsequent slides, this occurs in younger women. And there's a, therefore a lifetime disadvantage that, that uh, is associated with this disease. If you recall, I mentioned that um, pregnancy increases the symptoms of many diseases, but actually reduces the symptoms of one. And this is the one, multiple sclerosis. Ovarian hormones and pregnancy hormones have been implicated in the etiology and of multiple sclerosis. And some aspect of pregnancy hormones actually results in uh, um, a suppression of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis in affected women. Alzheimer's disease. Now this is a very interesting sex difference. Um, and I say interesting because it, it is very clear that there are many more women with Alzheimer's disease in the US as compared to men. So the prevalence 
is much higher in women. If you cast your attention on this bar over here, there are 3.2 million women with, with Alzheimer's disease and 1.9 million with um, Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, in her 60s, a woman's estimated lifetime risk for Alzheimer's is one in six. By comparison, for breast cancer, it is one in 11. Clearly a, a, a very big difference in this prevalence. It is not entirely clear what underlies this difference. It could be related to the fact that women frequently live longer than men in most countries. And, it, and because Alzheimer's is a disease of the elderly, it could simply be related to their longevity. Another hypothesis is that women may live longer with Alzheimer's disease as compared to men who might not live as long with the disease. This is an area that needs active research in understanding the um, uh, sex prevalence. Parkinson's disease. Now this is a disease, interestingly enough, where men are much more likely to be affected as compared to women. So a typical Parkinson's patient, as you might be aware, uh, has a stooped posture, has rigidity, a facial uh, a mask like expression, a forward tilt and tremors. It is very clearly associated with a particular portion of the brain called the substantia nigra. And, uh, and these neurons in this area make dopamine and several therapies for Parkinson's disease are associated with trying to maintain adequate levels or precursor for dopamine. Men are much more likely than women to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It's about three to two. Now, in women, the risk for Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonianism tends to increase in women who've had their ovaries and their uterus surgically removed. And I want to show you a slide uh, from the work of Dr. Roca and his colleagues from Mayo Clinic. In this study, they show, this was a few years ago, that they compared women who had had any type of oophorectomy, that is either unilateral or bilateral, and they compared those women with a group of referent women who had not undergone this surgery. And what they found is that there was a significant increase in the odds ratio of women with ophorectomy developing Parkinsonianism. In fact, the same thing is true if you consider women with bilateral ophorectomy, that is both the ovaries are removed. This is a very clear instance of where the gonadal um, uh, organs or their secretions might be implicated in the pathology of this disease. There are also sex differences in how the, the, the Parkinson's disease presents. In women, they're more likely to present with a, uh, with a tremor. And I want to bring your attention to this last, the second last bullet here. There's a great deal more self-reporting of depression, fatigue, nervousness, restlessness in women as compared to men. And this appears to be a feature of many neurological diseases in terms of their symptomology or what gets reported. Women, however, have a slower progression to cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. Epilepsy. This is also part of the neurology module. And I just have one slide for you today here. There are sex and age differences in the a specific type of epilepsy syndrome or its manifestation. In fact, there is one specific type of epilepsy called catamenial epilepsy that is actually associated with the menstrual cycle. Of course, this occurs only in women and, and there is a significant interest in, in discovering therapeutic options for this, including at my institution. As you see over here, some of these differences, sex differences are related to symptoms. They're related to the area or the isolated auras or secondary generalizations of the epilepsy or in terms of focal cortical dysplasias. So these are subtle differences in the manifestation and presentation of epilepsy. Again, more details in the module as Dr. Barr pointed out. <laughs> 
I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about stroke. This is an area that I'm actively involved in studying and I am, um, and, and we know a fair amount about sex differences uh, in terms of several aspects of the disease and I'll go through them in, in each slide. So stroke is the fifth leading cause of death and the leading cause of long-term disability outside of war. It's an expensive disease when you consider the care that patients will need and the fact that nearly three fourths of a million people will experience a new or recurring stroke every year. Sex differences in stroke, and I'm going to be restricting my, my discussion today about ischemic stroke, can be seen in the incidence, in the risk factors, in the outcomes, in the symptoms, and in the therapies. And, it's, and this is something I, 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 I think we need to pay a lot of attention to. So in terms of the incidence of stroke, about 58% of US stroke deaths in 2015 were among women. It's a little bit lopsided in terms of fatalities. And the rate of stroke in women is quite low in their younger years, in the premenopausal years. It starts to become equivalent to that of men after menopause. And then after the age of 80, the rate of stroke in women surpasses that of men. Again, there is a possibility that women may have a higher lifetime risk of stroke because they live longer or they may live longer with the disease. So what are the sex differences in the risk factors? Many of us are aware of the sex difference of the, of the risk factors for stroke or cardiovascular disease, they're quite similar. For example, diet or lack of exercise or obesity, et cetera. However, within these are sex differences that may put women at a much greater risk for stroke or for more debilitating strokes or strokes at an earlier time point. One of these is pregnancy, pregnancy associated strokes. Cigarette smoking, again, a risk factor for both males and females, but in women, who are on birth control medication, especially earlier types of birth control medication, which had higher levels of hormone, cigarette smoking would increase the risk of throwing a clot. Diabetes is also a risk factor, and women after the age of 45, around the perimenopause, are much more likely to develop diabetes at any, rather than any other time. Hormone therapy after menopause has also been linked to increased ischemic stroke fatalities. This is data from the Women's Health Initiative study. And atrial fibrillation. Now this is a very, it's a very interesting point. Atrial fibrillation actually occurs much more in men than in women. However, it is a significant risk factor for women as compared to men. And the reason for this is very likely that women who have atrial fibrillation and therefore the possibility of developing clots which may eventually travel to, to target organs um, are, are undertreated for medications related to uh, clot resolution. So Coumadin, for example, which is very commonly prescribed for uh, reducing clot formation tends to lead to bleeding in women and therefore women are likely to be undertreated now with newer therapies, um, this, this should become less of a sex difference factor than it used to be. But again, keep in mind that sometimes it is not simply the biology, but it is the biology interacting with other aspects of the environment, like the ability to treat with drugs. Again, here, this brings um, uh, attention to another risk factor that we don't pay a lot of attention to. Sometimes sex differences in diseases may be at the intersection of biology and sociology. So for example, women tend to have their strokes when they're older. This may be at a time when they are empty nesters or they may have outlived their spouses and are therefore alone at home when they have a stroke. And therefore they are unlikely to show up in time to be able to receive one of the few FDA approved therapies for stroke, which is uh, TPA. This increases their risk of having a much more severe outcome after stroke. So 
one of the ways in which sex differences in the outcomes for stroke may simply be due to non-traditional types of symptoms. And we see this increasingly in cardiovascular disease and in stroke. Most men and women will show traditional stroke symptoms. As you can see in this picture over here, which is in many PSAs, uh, you might have a facial group, you may not be able to raise your arm, you may have slurred speech or, or you know, saliva drooling, et cetera. These are signs of a very typical stroke and it is your, your clue to act very, very quickly because time is of the essence in treating stroke. Now, while women will also ex experience these traditional symptoms, they are also more likely to report weakness as a symptom. They're more likely to report a somatic cluster such as nausea, migraines, neck pain, face pain, et cetera. I want you to, to consider this possibility. If you have a patient in ER and you have a person with a drool and, and not able to speak, that person is much more immediately likely to be, to be triaged as a stroke patient as opposed to anything else. But a patient who reports that her head hurts or that she feels nauseous, you might waste valuable time in making an accurate diagnosis. And so knowing that there are different stroke symptoms for men and women is critical. And this should be a very important part of our medical education of our trainees in alerting them to differences in, in, in sex differences in symptoms for even very traditional diseases. And finally, and this is emerging in the preclinical literature, there is an intense amount of effort devoted to discovering stroke neuroprotectants. We only have a couple of approaches to stroke therapy for stroke patients. One of them is TPA, thrombolytics. The other one is now endovascular surgery where you can simply retrieve the clot and reestablish circulation in the brain. And this, a, a good adjunct to these therapies or even first line therapies could be new neuroprotectants. Several labs have been focused on neuroprotectants, and I'm, uh, I'm showing you the work over here from the lab of Louise McCullough and Patty Hearn and from my own. And we've been comparing some uh, novel neuroprotectants in both sexes, and they appear to show effectiveness in either one sex or the other. And this is a very important emerging area of therapeutic development that a drug might work only in one sex. And this is an important thing to keep in mind because I want to talk a little bit about a case study where perhaps this did not happen. This was a study involving a compounds called um, the Lazaroids. And what I'm showing you over here in bullet form is information that is in a very nice article, a review article written up by Larry Cahill and Ed Hall. Ed Hall was actually uh, among the group that discovered this compound. Tyrolizad methylate uh, was called, was nicknamed the Lazaroid because it, in, in preclinical work, it appeared to literally raise animals from the dead. It was very effective for hemorrhagic stroke in preclinical studies as well as TBI. And it was then put into clinical trial for, for safety and toxicity where it did well. And then it went into actual trials to see if there was efficacy and improving patient health. Several trials were performed. And right from the first trial, there was evidence that there was reduced mortality and better scores on the Glasgow outcome scale in males. In fact, in the treatment arm, there was no mortality among males. However, this was not reported separately for males and females statistically. The study was not designed and segregated for sex. Subsequent studies also did not do that, and eventually it failed to receive FDA approval. So sadly, a potentially usable drug was abandoned. A lot of the preclinical work for this drug was done actually in male animals. And in clinical trials, both males and females were included. And this is where the sex difference became very obvious.
This to me is a very powerful reason to emphasize sex differences in our research efforts. NIH policy has always required uh, that both men and women be included in trials. This was a policy and later became law through the NIH Revitalization Act in 93. So in clinical trials, both sexes had to be involved. But in basic science, while it was recommended and people were including them, it was not as aggressively done as one would appreciate. This, in, in 2015, the NIH, um, with the efforts of the ORWH, put together a policy on inclusion of sex as the biological variable in preclinical research and, and strongly recommended that both sexes should be included in studies right from the preclinical stages of planning and preparation. As many of you know, this is typically how research on new drugs or new treatments or new understanding of a disease proceeds. You start with cells. You then move on to whole animals, uh, usually rodents. If things look promising, you move to human subjects. And after clinical trials, this might eventually enter med medical practice. What one would hope is that males and females would be included in all of these endeavors. However, this is a slide, uh, and I want to give thanks to Dr. Jenkins for sharing this. Typically, in cell work, it's either undefined where the cell came from or possibly male. In animals, it is usually undefined or possibly males. And in many trials, they were uh, uh, either only male or not enough women. And therefore, you end up with a situation where a drug might not effectively translate from bench to bedside. I want to show you a couple of slides about how, whether or not there's been any success in including reporting uh, the sex of cells in studies. And this is data from uh, several journals that publish work on the cardiovascular field. What you're looking at in gray over here is articles that did not specify the sex of the cell. What you're looking at in red is when they said this, the cells came from males, green for females, and blue when it included both males and females. Our goal, obviously, would be to try and in, increase this blue bar as much as we can. What about in vivo work? In in vivo work, there, is, there has been some improvement. Uh, this is data comparing the percent of articles in several disciplines between the 10 years from 2009 to 2019. So this would represent about four years after the SABV document was, was uh, released. Now in some fields, and I want you to pay attention to the presence of these purple bars over here. These represent that both sexes were used. And in reproduction, as you might expect, it's either males or females or both. And, and that's understandable. The reproductive organs tend to be different. Behavioral physiology has done a rather good job, as has behavior. But in some disciplines, there still needs to be work done. Although in general biology and in immunology and in neuroscience, there appears to be a significant uptick in the inclusion of both sexes in, in, in research articles. So how do we integrate sex differences in our training efforts? And this is the last part of the talk. One of the ways in which we can integrate sex differences in training efforts has really been championed and led by the ORWH. The ORWH has two uh, uh, hallmark programs one of these is the Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health that focuses specifically on women's health. And they also have another program called Specialized Centers of Research Excellence on Sex Differences. This specifically speaks to the importance and the urgency of looking at sex differences. These are referred to as the scores. There are currently several funded scores and they are in several disciplines. For example, musculoskeletal, 
health disparities in smoking, metabolism, uh, pelvic prolapse, cardiovascular disease, affective disorders. In fact, here is a picture of Dr. Clayton and her SCORE um, PIs. So this is a critical effort led uh, through the NIH on focusing on sex differences in training and in, in research activities. And another important way in which this is going forward are these e-learning programs that Dr. Barr spoke about and Dr. Clayton spoke about. And these are the modules that, will, that are being released. At least three or four of them are out. Other ones are in the works. And these are opportunities for people um, at any level of training to, to view and to test themselves on recognizing and learning about sex differences in some of the major disease processes of our time. The scores and the birches have done an excellent job, but you might be saying to yourself, there's not a lot of them. What can we do at the local level? And, and this is something I, I, I want to speak to. These efforts really start in your classroom. For those of you over here who are faculty and are involved with the training of graduate or medical students, I'm speaking directly to you. It really starts with individual faculty. Some disciplines really lend themselves easily to talking about sex differences, such as cardiovascular disease, neurosciences, reproductive biology, behavior. Others, you have to uh, put in some effort. Let me give you an example from just yesterday. I was teaching uh, gross anatomy to first year medical students and the lecture was on the intrinsic muscles of the hand and the palm of the hand. Not a subject that you would think would lend itself easily to sex differences. However, there is a sex dimorphism in a, in a, in a fairly significant uh, hand-related clinical condition called Dupuytren's contracture. So wherever possible, whatever opportunities you have to teach your students, whatever lecture you're talking about, it would be um, really informative and helpful to your students to include some aspect of sex differences or some aspect of how the presentation or the etiology might vary by, by sex. This would really spark research and, and, and among young scientists who are just starting to develop their ideas for theses, who are just starting to develop their ideas for what speciality they might be interested in. So a local effort cannot be understated. And I want to give you another example of a local research and training effort that uh, I put together at the a &M. It's called the Women's Health in Neuroscience Program. We started this about eight years ago. And the idea then was simply to have an informal group of faculty whose research lends itself to either sex differences or women's health and to be able to provide a forum for discussion, to invite speakers to talk about this, and to be able to be engaged with graduate training and medical school training through this program. Here are some of our researchers, Dr. Srinivasan, who studies Parkinson's disease, which I explained earlier, has a very definite sex bias uh, uh, where men are more likely to experience the disease. Dr. Reddy, who studies epilepsy and was actually a pioneer in developing an animal model for catamenial epilepsy and developing novel therapeutics. Um, Dr. Miranda, who studies maternal health, and Jane Welsh, who studies uh, multiple sclerosis. We have a, a, a very specific directed effort through this program through what we call the WIND scholars. And the WIND scholars are simply postdoctoral scientists who apply to the program and uh, their training very uh, purposefully involves an emphasis on sex differences. Our first WIND scholar it was Dr. Uh, MJ Park. Uh, she was with uh, us uh, for about five years and she moved to South Korea recently back to her home country and is an assistant professor at Chungnam University. And when she moved over there, she became associated with a group doing inner ear research. And uh, this is an excellent example of innovation because of her background and her exposure to sex differences. She included sex as a biological variable while developing her own grant. And this actually helped her obtain uh, a successful five years of support. <laughs> 
Our current WIN scholar is Dr. Amanda Mankey. Uh, she's currently an associate research scientist at the ANM, and her interest is neural development, teratology, and the effect of drugs, especially alcohol, on neural progenitor cells. She has really brought an important and interesting aspect to a, uh, a well-studied prenatal teratogen, namely alcohol. And uh, Dr. Mankey is uh, a very strong advocate of including both males and females uh, in, her, in her studies. And in fact, even in neural progenitor cells where there are remarkably and surprisingly sex differences. One of the things that she does routinely and that we encourage through this program is attendance to the uh, uh, society uh, called OSSD. This is the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. This is a, uh, an excellent venue for trainees as well as scholars in the field who are studying a disease that is perhaps gendered, that perhaps has differences in either their presentation or their treatment or their etiology. This is an excellent venue to present your work. These are um, the current and immediate past and president elect of the society. They hold uh, an annual meeting and the really uh, uh, unique feature of this meeting is while you might learn about sex differences and present work on sex differences in your own professional societies, at OSSD is, is the chance that you would get to listen to sex differences in, in cardiovascular disease, in, in, uh, cardiovas in, in uh, uh, neurological disease, in musculoskeletal disease, in stem cells, the entire gamut of sex differences. And there are clearly differences in, in the strides that various fields have made with respect to studying sex differences. And it's a great opportunity to meet and speak with experts and network with them, as well as uh, for your trainees. I highly recommend uh, the OSSD. I'm going to stop now and thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Sarabji, for a fascinating presentation. Um, my name is Erin South from FDA's Office of Women's Health, and I'll be helping to moderate our Q&A session. Uh, reminder to the audience that you can type your questions into the chat box. We will try to get through as many as we can. And also, just as a reminder, um, this session has been recorded, and the recording uh, will be available within a couple of weeks uh, for those of you who want to follow up with the recording. So we have several questions coming in. Our first question, Dr. Sarabji, again, by analogy to race, how much does clinician gender stereotyping impact diagnosis and outcomes? I know there is evidence for this in cardiac care. Younger women get less aggressive treatment, so they tend to have worse outcomes. It sounds like it also impacts male breast cancer uh, and osteoporosis. And what about psychiatric disease? That is an excellent question. And it is a, uh, a, a great opportunity uh, for me to, to underscore the importance of, of training uh, and, and, and talking about sex differences in medical school education. Yes, there are very definitely certain uh, predispositions to think of a disease as being a male typical disease and therefore a male presenting with a very specific set of criteria is more likely to be diagnosed, for example, for cardiovascular disease and a woman more easily and more frequently uh, diagnosed with um, uh, risk for breast cancer or osteoporosis. These types of um, gendered diagnoses do exist. Our best hope is to minimize them through education right from our classrooms. When you talk to your medical school students about lectures, no matter what the topic is, to introduce the idea that one of the first things you will notice when a patient enters your office is, is well, their race and whether they're male or female or whether they're adult and child. It is such an obvious criteria and it should enter your thinking when you're making up your differential diagnosis. It should enter your thinking about the questions that you ask. So I'm, I'm, what I'm advocating over here is education in this area, not just for students, but also in continuing medical education through other modules like the one that we have uh, through the e-learning 
Thank you. Well, we're getting several questions coming in from our audience. The next question, it is one thing to use both sexes in research, but quite another to analyze by sex and not just use sex as a covariate, which is what most papers seem to do. Wondering how we can encourage this in publication. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a trend where because of the policy and a desire to, to be compliant with the SABV policy, people are including animals of both sexes. However, if you club them all together, you are likely to miss very important differences. It is really important to stratify for sex when you are in the experimental design stages so that you're able to adequately capture the sex differences and then, then direct your future studies to either include both sexes or specifically go after the difference that you noticed or to club them together. There will be some findings where sex will not play a very big role there will be other findings where it will play a significant role. And unless you adequately power for those, you will not be able to capture them. So hand in hand with an understanding and appreciation for including both sexes is an appreciation for experimental design and how animals should be incorporated. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions, uh, several about the WIND program. This uh, this audience member asks, how have you funded your WIN scholars? Did you seek internal sources or are there federal sources, for example, from ORWH for such programs? That is another very good question. So um, the WIN program is funded from internal sources. I showed you in my slide the picture of our uh, internal clinical advisory group one of whom is Dr. Nancy Dickey. The program began when Dr. Dickey was the Dean of the College of Medicine and subsequently the president of the AM Health Science Center at the time. Um, she was an advocate of women's health herself. And when we approached her with this idea for this program, she actually funded the Win Scholar for several years. Now, the way we set up the program is that once a student or a scholar enters the program, they receive a year of funding from these internal sources. After that, they identify a member laboratory and then that laboratory is responsible for future training and support of that individual. But the mentorship in terms of sex differences and women's health continues while they're in the program. So right now it is an internally funded effort um, we very much hope to be able to make this an externally funded effort. But the point I wanted to make there is that all of the scores and the BIRCH programs that are currently there all began with some internal drive to develop this issue. Terrific. Um, and it looks like we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. How can we better motivate interdisciplinary studies? It seems that sex and gender differences are a complex interaction between biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors. To really understand the interaction between these elements likely requires interdisciplinary teams. And I think it got cut off, but um, just the question is, how can we better motivate interdisciplinary studies? This is a very good point. All of our training, and I'll speak now to graduate training, because that's what I'm most familiar with, makes us increasingly more and more expert in our particular discipline, in my case, neurosciences. And as I moved from understanding uh, brain injury towards stroke, it became very clear I needed to know more about cerebrovascular biology. I needed to know more about immunology and inflammation and, and now more about the gut microbiome. So as, uh, as your research careers develop and evolve, you will A, have to either learn all of this yourself again or more practically find experts to connect with, uh, which is what I did. For example, uh, Dr. Jane Welsh, who studies uh, multiple sclerosis, has been a, um, an internal mentor for me on immunology and inflammation. Uh, we have a very good GI 
uh, gastrointestinal unit at the veterinary school here. They have been my mentors in understanding gut dysbiosis in the context of stroke. You will have to find colleagues to collaborate with. And again, this takes me back to the point about education. We need to educate our students so that they continue to appreciate that they will need to collaborate with experts outside of the area in which they're specializing. We have a graduate course at, at my institution, which is called Pathogenesis of Human Disease. And it really does, is offered in a modular way. It's got brain disease, it's got cardiovascular, it's got immunology, it's got cancer. Students are exposed to all of these. You may be coming in here to study as a neuroscientist, but you're going to get a little immunology as well and a little of cardiovascular uh, biology and um, uh, cancer. And so you need to uh, start with the training so that the next generation of student is fully understand that, that their labs or their research endeavors will be multidisciplinary and will involve more than just their principal area of study. Thank you. Uh, related to the new research, uh, research grant program, how can animal studies contribute to understanding interactions between sex and gender when animals don't have gender? It's a, it's a good question and a tricky question. And for preclinical work at this point, um, we are essentially looking at sex differences. And I hope I, I underscored that when I talked about our preclinical research. The understanding of how sex and gender modifies disease presentation and disease pathology is very understudy. And it will have to be done much more in, in clinical studies and in studies incorporating human populations. And we, there's already evidence that uh, gender can also influence the presentation of disease. Uh, for example, uh, work at Stanford has shown that people who identify uh, more along the continuum of feminine as opposed to masculine might also report more female type cardiovascular symptoms as opposed to somebody who identifies on the other end of the continuum. This has to be done largely in human, in human studies. And at this time, we have reached the end of our webinar. Um, I would like to extend a sincere thanks to Dr. Sarabji for a wonderful presentation today, um, as well as to the FDA Office of Women's Health for their collaboration on the development of the Bench to Bedside course. And of course, the authors and subject matter experts without whom the modules would not exist. Um, we'd also like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us today and for your engagement on today's webinar. We were not able to get through the questions um, because of the high level of engagement, um, but we do encourage you to join, uh, to take a look at the Bench to Bedside course. The web address has been pasted in the chat box a few times and it's also available on the ORWH website. Um, as we mentioned at the open of this webinar, the neurology module is available as our modules on immunology, cardiovascular disease, and pulmonary disease, with two additional modules anticipated this fall, covering endocrinology and mental health. Everyone who's attended and registered for the webinar today will receive an email from ORWH in the next few weeks that will contain a link to the recording of the webinar, as well as um, follow-up information. So again, thank you all so much for joining us, and um, thank you, Dr. Sarabji. I had one comment. I see Dr. Eula here. Uh, Dr. Eula was a co-author on the neurology module. I wanted to give a shout out to her. Thank you. Thank you all.